for 20 years now. Yeah. Okay. See, so we're recording. And we are good to go. Adam, do you want to let everybody in or should I? Oh, there we go. Wait a couple more seconds. Uh, before we start, uh, anybody in religion JSP 200 who's here, just say a quick hello on the chat, and that way I will have your names. I think we'll start. Sorry, just a little negotiating here. Uh, here's my introduction. Welcome everybody and good evening. Uh, I'm Zachary Braderman in literally in the Department of Religion here at uh, Syracuse University. Uh, as director of the Jewish Studies Program, it is my special privilege and pleasure to introduce this year's annual BG Rudolph Lecture in Jewish Studies, James Leffler. Uh, James Leffler is the Jay Berkowitz Professor of Jewish History and the Ida and Nathan uh, Collides Director of Jewish Studies at the University of Virginia. Our guest tonight is a student of Jewish history, Russian and Eastern European history, international legal history, and the history of human rights. He is the co-editor of The Law of Strangers, Jewish Lawyers, and International Law in the 20th Century, a 2019 collection, which pairs together historians and legal scholars and theorists. The Law of Strangers builds upon rooted cosmopolitans, Jews and human rights in the 20th century, published by Yale University Press in 2018, uh, which made an immediate splash upon its publication. It's a book about Jewish jurists and the emergence of modern human rights law out of the interwar period in Eastern Europe. As she appears in Rooted Cosmopolitans, Hannah Arendt's question, who has the rights to have rights, underscores how human rights law ultimately devolves upon harsh realities of statehood and political power. Once upon a time, Jewish rights were human rights and human rights were Jewish rights. Ultimately fragile at its origin point, human rights law was about securing minority rights for Jews and others in the newly emergent ethno nation states of Eastern Europe in the interwar period. Very much the work of immigrant Jewish lawyers, many of them committed Zionists now relocated in New York, 
human rights as a discourse, as a practice, culminates with the passage of the UN Declaration of Human Rights and the UN Genocide Convention in 1948. Uh, all of this very much the handwork of the jurists dis uh, uh, discussed in, uh, in, in Rooted Cosmopolitans. Leffler then follows the parting of the ways between Jews and Jewishness and the human rights community in the wake of the establishment of the State of Israel in 1948 in the Arab-Palestinian refugee crisis, and after the 1967 Six-Day War, pressured by the geopolitics of Soviet anti-Semitism, pan-Arabism, and decolonialism. Violent nationalism would be the scene connecting rooted cosmopolitans to Professor Leffler's new work, which picks up in America, at work on a project exploring legal responses to anti-Semitism in America. Caught between universalism and parochialism, the American Jewish experience opens up larger questions about liberalism and the limits of law, power of law and the limits of law. The new work looks back to the Nazi march in Skokie, Illinois, outside Chicago in 1977, when American Nazis seemed less of an obvious threat to the project of American democracy than they do today. Professor Leffler's remarks tonight will extrapolate upon the 2017 so-called Unite the Right March and Riot in Charlottesville, Virginia, and the trial in civil court against the defendants of who's who will the American right, white supremacists, neo-Nazis, neo-Confederates found liable for civil conspiracy under Virginia state law, but not federal charges. When I invited Professor Leffler last December to deliver this lecture, what I had very much in mind was the resurgence of anti-Semitism, the ever-present and powerful currents of anti-Black racism, and the fragility of liberal order in the wake of Charlottesville. Unexpected, utterly unexpected, was the confluence of Professor Leffler's larger body of work on law and human rights with the disaster now unfolding in Ukraine and Russia, from where so much of Leffler's work, Professor Leffler's work unfolds. Professor Leffler is, among, uh, is, is, is also the author of The Most Musical Nation, Jews and Culture in the Late Russian Empire. This is an early, relatively early, 2010 book about how and why Jewish music became a gateway to modern Jewish identity at the turn of the last century. I hope someone asks him about the interconnection between Jewish music and Russia and international law. Perhaps, I suspect, the answer lies in the last chapter of that study entitled The Neighbors' Melodies, The Politics of Music and War and Revolution. As he moves from tales from Odessa and St. Petersburg towards a concluding coda in the musical composition and libretto Bobby Yar by Shostakovich and Yegevne Yevtushenko, in this early, earlier study of the more distant recent past, Professor Leffler looks to the morphing of identity under sheer physical violence and what he calls the revenge of politics. Embedded in these variegated legal historical geographies, Professor Leffler's topic with us tonight is after Charlottesville, anti-Semitism, race, and law. I cannot thank enough the generosity of the BG Rudolph family and the continuing support for the Jewish Studies Program from Deans Karen Roulant and Jerry Greenberg and the tireless attention of Stacy Webb in Dean Greenberg's office to make this evening possible, and to Adam Brett for so expertly managing this event for us tonight. Uh, please join me in welcoming uh, Jim Leffler. Thank you very much, Zach. Um, it's a pleasure to be with you tonight. Um, that was a wonderful introduction. I feel like my work is done. <laughs> You've summed it all up. Um, but I want to thank you um, and um, Dean Greenberg and um, the Jewish Studies Program, as well as Adam Brett, uh, for the chance to put this together and, and come to you to deliver the Rudolph Lecture this year. Um, I'm very pleased to be here. Um, I'm only sorry that it's not in person, but I'm happy that it's brought uh, more of us together. And as, as many of us on this uh, Zoom call um, can see each other, uh, it's really nice to gather in this way. Um, I'm also sorry that my talk is not a happier one. It's not about music. It is, it is about the revenge of politics and then some. Um, but it's a reflection of the moment we're living in um, and the questions that I think we as scholars are really grappling with. So um, I am uh, going to begin and I'm going to share my screen. I'm going to use a few slides because there's some really um, compelling visual material that will go with the talk tonight. Um, and I, I want to share it with you, uh, and you'll see, I think, immediately what it is um, uh, in terms of 
a um, uh, a story in pictures as well as in words. Um, so, uh, as you heard, I come to you from the University of Virginia in Charlottesville, where I am tonight. Uh, four and a half years ago, on a Friday evening in August, a wave of white supremacist and neo-Nazi extremists descended on the campus of the University of Virginia. They marched in two columns carrying torches, trudging along, they barked and roared, making their way into the heart of the historic lawn, the quad of UVA. These white supremacists shouted several racist and anti-Semitic slogans, and chief among them was the phrase, Jews will not replace us. I want you to remember that because I'm going to come back to that. Um, now, uh, as they reached grounds, they surged towards a statue of Thomas Jefferson, where they found a small band of students uh, who had encircled it in an act of counter protest. These were UVA students, undergraduates. They threatened the students with lit torches and pepper sprayed them. Uh, and they continued to kind of uh, torment them. This is a picture of that scene. Uh, you can't really see the students because there really are very few of them. Um, and it was a night that uh, left those students fearing for their lives. Friday night was only a warm up for what happened the next day. Uh, the next day was really the main event of the weekend, the Unite the Right rally. The goal was to convene a broad range of radical rightist groups. Uh, as you heard Professor Brennerman uh, mention this, neo-Confederates, neo-Nazis, uh, folks with the alt-right, racial popul populists, and others uh, who joined together as part of a moment to escalate an ongoing campaign to win converts to their cause and to achieve media attention. Uh, their public goal was to stage a rally at a downtown park in which stood a statue of Robert E. Lee which they claimed to be defending on uh, free speech grounds and grounds of defending monuments. Their private goal, which they discussed in Discord chat rooms and phone texts and emails, was to bait their political adversaries, who they defined as Black Lives Matter and Antifa, into actual street fighting. They wanted, in other words, to produce violence to justify their cause, to expose their enemies, and to accelerate the path to racial warfare. They got uh, what they came for. The violence um, uh, turned out, uh, emerged um, from a menacing crowd of white supremacists who organized themselves um, in units, some of them marching in phalanx formation with homemade riot weapons, and appeared Saturday morning. They were met by counter protesters who included a number of local and national clergy, uh, curious townspeople. Uh, students from the university uh, and others who'd come simply to confront them. Uh, and this quickly devolved into a, a riot, a very violent, chaotic scene with peaceful protesters injured. Um, people, including a local African American man, grabbed, pinned, and beaten. Uh, and then came a car ramming. One of the white supremacists drove his car into a crowd of people who were actually walking away from this chaotic scene injuring several of them and claiming the life of one local woman, a woman named Heather Heyer. When it was all over, many questions remained. Why had the white supremacists chanted, Jews will not replace us? And why had the students who, who met them on that Friday night responded with Black Lives Matter? Was this all truly a First Amendment protected speech? Uh, was this all uh, intended to culminate in that violence? And most urgently for a lot of people, um, what could be done to stop these bigots and to punish them for what they had done to this community and to those injured in the process? In search of answers, I spent a month last fall um, in the courthouse, the federal courthouse in Charlottesville, reporting on the trial of these white supremacists. I wrote about it for the Atlantic magazine. And that forms part of a larger book that I'm writing about, um, as you heard, anti-Semitism uh, in post-war American society uh, and the attempts to, to fight it, to respond to it with law from that moment of right after World War II down to the present. So what you're gonna hear tonight are some reflections drawn from that experience in my research about anti-Semitism, race and law after Charlottesville. And what I'm, I'm gonna say basically is I want, to, um, I want to share some reflections to try and open up some aspects of the trial and some aspects of um, uh, what it taught me about um, white supremacy and anti-Semitism today. 
Uh, and then, of course, uh, we'll have time, which I look forward to, for some questions about this, and I can comment on other things that I may mention, uh, but not focus on for the sake of giving you kind of a focused presentation about this material. So what I want to do is focus my remarks um, around that slogan that I've now referred to twice, which is, Jews will not replace us. In that phrase, I want to suggest we can find something revealing about the meaning of a key concept at the heart of contempor contemporary anti-Semitism in America, and that is this word replacement. And when we listen carefully to the language of hate, we find three different kinds of replacement that are animating so much of contemporary American anti-Semitism. And what I'm going to try and do um, is trace them out for you as I saw them present, presenting themselves in the trial itself, in the words of the people in the trial, um, and then try and make sense of what they are and how they interact with one another to, un, to tease out really what anti-Semitism is in the minds of some of the most self-declared um, prolific anti-Semites, and then also to use it to ask, ask some questions about um, these larger issues of race and law uh, that we are all thinking about in, in so many ways today. So after Charlottesville, after that weekend, the, car, the driver of the car went to jail. Um, he was charged with murder. He went to jail for life. Um, many, many life sentences. Others uh, were arrested um, for assaults. Um, but the overall organizers, all of these leaders of this um, Unite the Right march, um, simply disappeared. And the question arose, what could be done to punish them? The Trump administration declined to press federal charges. As you may recall, this became a national controversy, uh, even involving what uh, President Trump at the time actually had said and what he was intimating, although it was pretty clear to people what he was saying. Uh, local authorities and state authorities struggled to define a case, uh, how to charge these people, how to hold them responsible for the violence, because the rally was permitted and the organizers disclaimed any responsibility for starting the violence. In fact, they said, we didn't tell anybody to do this. Uh, we simply came to exercise our free speech rights and we were victims of the violence as well. So what happened in the absence of um, state action was that nine victims injured in the attack, the car attack, filed a civil lawsuit uh, for damages suffered. And actually, I should say the car attack and also some of the um, small scale, but real violence on the night before on that Friday. Um, uh, a legal nonprofit sprang up to represent them. That's what you're seeing here on the screen, Integrity First. Uh, an interesting organization, about which I can say more because it involves some very prominent uh, civil rights lawyers. Uh, and all this led to the Charlottesville courtroom last October in a trial. Now, uh, here you see um, another shot of the attack, and here you see um, some of the victims uh, who uh, turned into plaintiffs and filed the suit together. This trial involved uh, four years of planning, four weeks of court proceedings, um, nine plaintiffs, as I've said, 24 defendants, both individuals and corporate entities, the organizations themselves, 36 witnesses, and five terabytes of digital evidence. It was a mammoth undertaking with heavy security and a complex process of chasing down non-compliant defendants and fugitives, in fact. But in the end, it all boiled down to one question. And that question was, did the organizers of this 2017 rally conspire to commit racially motivated violence, which resulted in injuries, physical, emotional, and monetary harm to the plaintiffs? So again, a civil lawsuit. And under that heading, the lawsuit grouped a variety of violations of Virginia state law against civil conspiracy, as well as hate crime statutes, not hate speech, again, to be clear, but hate crimes, including assault, battery, intimidation, harassment, and other forms of violence, quote, motivated by racial, religious, or ethnic animosity. So in other words, the victims sued for damages for a racially motivated conspiracy, but they're suing for their own damages as a civil lawsuit. These were state charges, but there was one twist, um, and you heard a mention of it in the introduction. The plaintiffs, plaintiffs also brought two federal claims, drawing on a little-known provision in the 1871 Ku Klux Klan Act. This was a federal law passed after the Civil War to stop white supremacist terror of that generation from disenfranchising newly emancipated African Americans and derailing the democratic electoral process in which they in America was involved. Now, that 1871 law is similar to the Virginia state law in that it allows private citizens to sue others for violating their civil rights. It um, is not a blanket 
uh, law about racial, ethnic, or, an, uh, or religious animosity. On the contrary, it talks about the rights of non-white persons and their supporters. And that's an interesting nuance to this. So in other words, um, uh, people who are targeted for being non-white uh, or people who are targeted um, for supporting them can claim um, standing to, under, this, under this law to sue. And that is how the plaintiffs uh, could invoke it against both racism and anti-Semitism. Uh, and what that charge did is also turn this case the way the law works from a, a state level case into a federal case with more exposure. Uh, and that's where it began to be heard in a federal courthouse in October. So I'm setting this up. Um, I'm going to turn in a second to talk to you about more of the specifics of this anti-Semitism. But before I do that, I just want to give you a little bit more um, of the flavor of what went down. This was a pretty surreal trial. The defendants were truly a motley crew. Uh, some of them represented themselves. Uh, and that, uh, as you may have heard, never goes well. Um, they tried courtroom monologues. Uh, they tried innuendo and dog whistling about the Jewishness of many of the lawyers for the plaintiffs. They denounced one another in vile gossipy terms. At the same time as they insisted they were men of principle, they were all men. Uh, and they all ultimately pursued the same defense, which was that this was protected speech. Hate by itself might be odious, but it wasn't illegal. Where there was violence, it came from Antifa and Black Lives Matter activists. Um, or it was the fault of the Charlottesville Police Department because they could not keep two um, intense crowds separated and they sort of fell down on the job. Most of all, they said, this is a trial in which they're, they're accused of a conspiracy, but there was no conspiracy because how could there have been? They hadn't ever met in the same place. These uh, 20 plus people uh, hadn't actually been together. Some of them didn't meet until that weekend. Some of them were never in the same place at the same time. And beyond that, um, what is what all they planned was a rally. Unfortunately for them, they left behind a massive digital trail. Decrypted chat threads, unlocked cell phones, leaked videos, and other data dumps revealed what they had done in the lead up to it. And all this evidence proved crucial at the trial. So I will say more about this uh, later on in this in this presentation about what happened and how that played out. But now I want to turn back to that phrase, which is really the heart of what I want to share with you. And that's this phrase, Jews will not replace us. As I said, um, there, there are kind of three ways in which you can understand replacement. And the first glimpse I got of that came already on the first day of the trial. Um, I've read like many people who study this topic, um, an awful lot of words uh, of anti-Semitic uh, speech over the years. But it was still very shocking to see um, the messages pop up uh, on the display in the courtroom and to see them read out loud. Um, that began on the first day with uh, the words of one of the organizers boasting that when he got to the rally, his entire speech would consist of six words. This is, this is the phrase of Dylan Hopper. You can see what he says there. We often hear about white supremacy's image of black inferiority, and Jews appear um, to many as kind of a sideshow, not white enough, not Christian, but not the true enemy. Um, but as this and other messages suggested throughout the trial, uh, so much at the heart of the white supremacist imagination uh, focuses on a Jewish racial enemy, right, uh, who is a threat to white racial purity. In other words, it was Jewish bodies that had to be destroyed, right? Um, it was Jews as a biological other that must physically be eliminated. That theme was echoed, as I've just said, throughout the trial. And the second quote up here from another one of the defendants captures this nicely, right? The total destruction of Jewry is the only way to ensure that we no longer will be plagued by the eternal enemy of all mankind. To do anything less than wage a war of extermination against these vermin would be a betrayal of our future generation. So um, this is actually not new language, right? Um, this is language we've seen before in the history of anti-Semitism. This is Nazi language. Um, but it struck me that uh, this was really central to what they were doing. And even though whiteness and Black Lives Matter uh, and Antifa seemed to be their targets they kept referring to, the language they used as they pumped themselves up and fantasized and planned to stalk violence was Jews. You know, Jews will not replace us. Jews must be stopped. Now. Um, so that's point one. The replacement in one sense is literal. Uh, 
Point two, however, is that not every defendant was so fixated on biological anti-Semitism. And as the trial wound on, more than one insisted that their enemy was not the Jew, or at least not every Jew, but it was, quote, the organized Jewish community uh, or the Zionist occupied government. And here I'll just explain, um, they're not referring to Israel, right? They're referring to the United States. These euphemisms uh, reveal a second meaning to Jews will not replace us. Physical replacement is only one strain, but the chant can also be taken in a transitive sense. Jews will not replace us with X. And in this iteration, it isn't the Jewish race or the Jewish body that threatens so much as racialized Jewish power or Jewish global superiority. This is the figural Jew, and the scholars on this conversation will, 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 um, you know, will recognize this formulation um, from work on the history of um, European philosophical thought and different uh, aspects of the history of anti-Semitism as well. Um, students here may also um, recognize this in the way people explain images of the Jew, Im using images of the Jew even when there aren't real Jews around. But the key thing here is that um, it was a consistent theme and it was a theme of a hidden or invisible presence operating behind the scenes. That came alive to me again um, in the words of another defendant, Dr. Michael Hill. Michael Hill is actually a card-carrying PhD in history um, who um, turned himself into um, a leader of a neo-Confederate movement. Uh, and you can see his words. I've come to the sincere belief that we who were there, we who were present in Charlottesville that day and who fought the Jew-directed communist horde were present for the very genesis of the resurrection of our folk. What's important about this is that the replacement, therefore, isn't always physical. The Jews don't need to be physically present to manipulate others. The communists, the globalists, Black Lives Matter, Antifa, the National Lawyers Guild, even the police force, in the, in the words of one defendant, into doing their bidding. Some of these groups were virtually Jewish, even if the members were plainly not. And that helps explain why the rally goers, the Unite the Writers, could interpret their street violence against uh, Christian white priests, Black and Latina young people, as a fight against Jews, right? They're sort of a, an enemy and inferiors, but they're also a stand-in for Jews and for Jewish power. I think that also explains why, uh, if you know anything about the, the uh, geography of the town of Charlottesville, why this rabid mob of rioters could essentially um, ignore the local synagogue, which was steps from where all this was taking place. Now, I'm not saying this to downplay the threat. Um, you know, friends and people I'm close to um, were there that day and, you know, spirited out the Torah scroll from the synagogue and felt an incredible sense of vulnerability, which has remained for Jewish people in Charlottesville. Um, but there was something striking about the fact that the obvious target for this movement of people who had spent so much time, continued to uh, frame what they did as a fight against Jews, could just pass by the synagogue and go direct towards this other mob of young people, basically, um, confronting them. This idea of Jews operating behind the scenes as, as a kind of form of secret power um, also dovetails uh, with what we've come to understand more broadly about uh, replacement theory, right, or white genocide. Um, and in the years since 2017, this is doctrine which has swept more and more uh, into the mainstream. Um, here I want to note um, one of the things that emerged from the trial is that one of the other defendants, Christopher Cantwell, represented himself. Uh, he may be vaguely familiar to some people on this call uh, as the crying Nazi from the Vice documentary in which he um, cries afterwards and, and, um, and has something of a, a meltdown. Um, so he ended up in prison on unrelated criminal charges, and um, he was brought from prison, from federal prison, to attend this trial and represent himself. One of the things that, that emerged from the trial is that in prison, he spends every night uh, with his fellow prisoners watching Tucker Carlson. Um, and cheering on Tucker Carlson. Um, again, what's interesting is Cantwell spoke at length during the trial about how he was a real radical and that um, he and others like him had dismissed Republicans and conservatives already by 2017 as not willing to go there in terms of race. Um, and basically the distinction, as he put it, was um, that the real conservatives are the ones who are willing to go there on race and willing to understand that the, the divide in society is about race. Um, and therefore, uh, there was a, already a disappointment that um, even President Trump didn't seem to be actually moving in the direction that they thought he would be. This is already by August 2017. Um, their verdict shifted over, over time, 
it's a complicated um, story we're talking about. But the key thing is um, the mainstream for them could be legitimate as it begins to embrace the rhetoric that they are uh, espousing. Okay, so there's replacement as physical threat from Jewish bodies, uh, and there's replacement as uh, invisible power by Jews. But there's a third kind of replacement that stood out to me during the trial, and it came uh, at a couple different points, but most clearly at the very, very end of the proceedings. Throughout this trial, um, perhaps the most striking uh, of the defendants was uh, Richard Spencer. For those of you who are uh, not familiar, or only vaguely familiar with him, um, he rose to fame um, in, the two th in the 2010s uh, as the iconic ideologue of the alt-right, presenting himself as a clean-cut, all-American um, type of person. Um, and Spencer uh, was someone who uh, presented himself uh, at the trial as a calm intellectual, professorial even. Uh, it was something of a, a strange homecoming for him. He went to the University of Virginia undergrad, um, and he uh, clearly learned some things or mislearned some things here. We know this because he studied music and medieval studies and some of the imagery with the torchlight processionals and um, things of that uh, character were um, clearly um, drawn from his early activities with drama also while he was a student. But at this trial, he had a different look. And the look he presented to the jury uh, and to um, the courtroom was that a person who had been chastened by what happened, that he learned from his mistakes, uh, that he never expected it to go this far, that he wasn't like this rabble rousing mob, that he had actually contempt for many of his co-defendants because they were um, not well-educated people. Uh, he disavowed violence, and he said that he wished to really transform the world with his ideas and learn the lessons of history. Um, he went on to emphasize that as a student of history, one couldn't expect these things to just be acted out through mobs in the street chasing down racial enemies. Uh, one had to understand world civilizations and the course of history. Uh, and he marveled uh, in, in this capacity actually at the uniqueness of history and even of Jewish history, calling Jewish survival one of the great miracles of history. He also noted the irony that his mentor in radical right politics had been a Jewish man, uh, which is true, um, and basically emphasized that he was, a, uh, as he put it, a race realist, but not a person of bigotry, right? not, not uh, seized by emotions or even uh, animus, but really a passion to get the world right the way it should be. Uh, this self-presentation was challenged uh, at the trial. Uh, it was challenged in particular by a secret, uh, a secret clip of him at a rally afterwards, screaming, and uh, this is actually um, uh, a still from it, he's giving the Hitler salute, um, screaming about racial superiority, screaming about um, mixed race people and black people. And what about Jews and anti-Semitism? As I've said, he kind of presented himself as a, a, as, as a, um, a man of, who was intrigued by Jews, right? Um, but there was an element of obsession, and replacement, replacement for him seemed to mean not the threat that Jews would take over America, um, but a different kind of threat and also a different kind of fantasy. And there was a threat not about Jews replacing whites, but about Christians replacing Jews. What do I mean by that? Uh, in his opening argument, Spencer began to talk about two kinds of justice. And the judge, judge cut him off and explained to him, as he was representing himself, that uh, opening arguments are not the time to give monologues. It was not in keeping with courtroom procedure. So he got upset, got frustrated, and then he stopped. In the closing, uh, he tried again. And it was a riveting, pretty, uh, truly bizarre moment. Spencer addressed the jury. Uh, he spoke again in the idiom of self-reflection, regrets, in a low voice about failings, about lessons learned, about we all wish we could go back and change things. Uh, and then he slipped into a different register, and he began to talk about the biblical scapegoat. And he began to say the biblical image of the scapegoat who was cast out into the wilderness for the community's sins. Uh, and as he was doing this, um, where I was sitting in the press gallery, uh, journalists began to titter, they began to laugh. People began to make 
to trade remarks and murmur things about his ego, about his bombast, about how silly it was, about how bizarre white supremacists are in their obsessions. And they couldn't quite get the goat thing. I didn't laugh because for me, it was very clear where he was going. And it was a monologue, uh, which was imbued with a deep Christianist anti-Jewish trope um, about bloodlust, about sins, and about um, the way Judaism supposedly works. Um, and it went on from there to emphasize that just like the goat is unfairly saddled with the sins, Jesus is unfairly, unfairly uh, saddled with the sins of the world. Uh, and just as a goat is stoned and killed by Israel, Jesus is killed by Israel. And as he was doing this, he's also sketching out um, uh, a, a binary, which is part of a long tradition of contrasting not just Jewish bloodlust, bloodlust and Christian grace, but also Jewish legalism, the lust for the law against the idea of true Christian justice and transcending the law for something else, for faith, for mercy, uh, contrasting vengeance, here personified by the Jewish lawyers, um, with the Christian yearning for something above vengeance and above the law. And so this is a, an enactment, in other words, of what's called Christian supersessionism, Christians replacing Jews. And this was the dream, in other words, uh, of white supremacists, of not simply combating Jews or displacing Jews, but also replacing Jews and a yearning for that. As it turned out, Spencer's second speech was also interrupted um, by the judge. Uh, and um, because it turned out, again, he got courtroom procedure wrong and he didn't realize that he just um, he couldn't go on in that direction. It was um, too removed from presenting the, the facts of the case and his argument for their interpretation. Um, he argued back, when am I going to get to make this? And the judge basically said no. And um, the judge was uh, determined to get the trial over before Thanksgiving. Uh, we know that. Uh, so we didn't get to hear the end, but we'd heard enough. What happened with all of this? Well, here I'm going to go off screen share uh, and uh, stop with the images and just share some reflections about this and about the end of the trial. So the jury deliberated. Um, and the jury found the defendants liable under state law for an unlawful conspiracy, civil conspiracy, to commit racially motivated violence. And they awarded damages to the tune of some $26 million. Um, the racial malice part of it, the racial motivation, wasn't hard for anyone to see. All this evidence, all of these remarks, even what people said in the courtroom. Still, the defendants insisted during the trial that they had not conspired. Right? These were sincerely held beliefs. Of course, um, this again doesn't matter because uh, the issue was, is there animus and is there a conspiracy? And the way the law works is that uh, it doesn't require a fully organized plan with the single sole intention to commit a crime, the way conspiracy works in American law. It can be a single unlawful act um, committed in the course of a whole bunch of other things that are perfectly legal. Um, even if the other behaviors and objectives were legal, including a public protest. Uh, and furthermore, uh, individual actions before, during, or after the events can serve as proof of the conspiracy to, and to show intention. Um, and most of all, the bar for a civil trial is low. It's not beyond a reasonable doubt, but it's a preponderance of evidence. So as the judge said to the jury, um, if 51% if you're at 51%, then you have to find these defendants liable. So the bar was passed. And yet, it was only a partial victory. Uh, and that's for two reasons. One, that $26 million may or may not ever be collected. Um, several of these defendants claimed that they had no money, um, but poverty. Uh, second, uh, the way the law works, it can be reduced. And there's a, an issue about a Supreme Court um, precedent on... Um, the way damages, compensatory and punitive damages, I can say more about that um, during Q&A, how those have to be correlated so you don't have excessive um, monies attached beyond uh, of a scale way beyond what the actual physical damage to the person was. Secondly, and perhaps more importantly, I think actually, the jury deadlocked on the federal conspiracy claims, that is the KKK law, the 1871 law. They didn't exonerate, uh, but they couldn't agree. And in the civil case, they didn't have to. They just can decline to issue a verdict, and they're not required to keep going. It's not a mistrial. It's just no verdict. 
Um, and the judge has the option to keep, ask them to keep going, but didn't. Uh, and that leaves it just moot, as if unresolved. Uh, it's a powerful statement, but it's unresolved. Does that matter? Probably not for this case, but it may matter for the larger civil rights fight against anti-Semitism and racism. Uh, and uh, it may matter in terms of the larger question of what we want law to do to be able to stop hate groups and to fix the boundary of what's legitimate speech and leg legitimate behavior and action, and also to understand who are the categories um, of vulnerability that need to be protected. So here I want to shift to the end of my remarks um, and return one more time to that chant, Jews will not replace us. So I said at the outset uh, that one of the puzzles of this event was that the chant um, was Jews will not replace us. And um, the main answer was Black Lives Matter, right? And it's a kind of an auditory mismatch that I think cries out for an explanation. Now, the simplest explanation is sociology. The people who were counter protesting um, were drawn mostly from the ranks of young progressive, politically progressive activists, particularly African-American and other people of color. Uh, Black Lives Matter is their slogan, right? It's the slogan of our days in terms of um, responding to racism, right, and against anti-Black racism. Uh, and we don't have a comparative slogan for anti-Semitism. I think that's one of the interesting things to imagine what that could be. After Pittsburgh, there were some uh, words floated. Um, there have been all kinds of memes that go up, um, but nothing sticks. And that it's, uh, in and of itself is, is worth reflecting on. Another issue is context. Despite the Nazi imagery and the anti-Semitism, which I'm stressing was so central to this, to that weekend and to the movement and to the trial, the focal point for the weekend was not, again, Jews, right? Um, Jews were all over it. Jews were surfing through the imagination of these um, anti-Semites, but the focus was the Confederate lost cause. And, and in that sense, that's why Charlottesville was chosen, right? Um, and that's also what many of the counter protesters recognized. The white supremacy that the students at Charlottesville recognized was more about ra America's racial past than its Jewish present. Indeed, and I think this is worth also reflecting on, it could be said that Charlottesville really revealed um, two different overlapping and yet distinct faces of white supremacy. And, it, and also engendered an awful lot of confusion. I can also say among even um, administrators and colleagues at the University of Virginia about what exactly was the target of this violence and how did it relate um, the Jewish experience to the experience of African Americans. What do I mean by that? Um, today we're in the midst of a, a deep reckoning with anti-Black bias, right? We recognize this as part of the fabric of American life and our debate is about how ingrained it is, how far back it goes in its, in its patterning and how to uproot it. Um, the languages that we use to describe that are white supremacy, and uh, as you know, this is the language also that um, is adopted by those who would want to frame this as systemic racism, right, as, as structures inside American life about race and against particularly color. And then there's a, the other kind of white supremacy, which is the deeply Christianist white nationalism. This is the strain that identifies Jews as the primal enemy along with other racial targets, right? It's not, it's not that they, the rest of um, minority America disappears, but it becomes the focal point for the reasons I've explained tonight, right? This idea of replacement, the Jews as themselves um, a menacing physical threat, the Jews themselves as the invisible um, power, uh, and the Jews themselves as the symbolic um, obstacle to, to redemption, to a Christian redemption that has to happen. The false Israel that has to be replaced by the new true Israel. And I think um, what we see, and certainly this is true in the trial, was kind of the overlap and almost the collision of these two different notions of white supremacy for the white supremacists themselves, but also for the people trying to explain what it was. You could see this in lots of different moments. Um, even the judge himself, and, and uh, uh, Clint, uh, an appointee of President Bill Clinton, um, uh, an octogenarian, um, puzzling over trying to explain what was going on at certain times uh, struggled um, with hypotheticals such as what would happen if Jewish people came to attack Christian people, um, which seemed to kind of miss exactly what was going on with the racialization of Jews and to kind of uh, actually kind of succumb to that framing of Christians and Jews in this symbolic opposition. But ultimately, what I want to say is that the choice of the slogan 
Jews will not replace us, Black Lives Matter, reflects the confusing, ambiguous place of Jews in American society. So Jews themselves uh, are pinned in between categories of race and religion, between the justice ideals of racial equality and religious freedom, and in between white America and communities of color. That's an ambiguity that historians note, we note, has sometimes served Jews actually well. It's allowed Jews to enter into the white majority while retaining a minority identity, right? But that ambiguous position is also um, why Jews have struggled to articulate, I think, for American society exactly how they want to be seen and protected and why they are a focal point for white supremacy in an era when so much of it seems to be targeted against black bodies. So where do Jews fit into 21st century America? The anti-Semites, as I've tried to demonstrate tonight, have their answer. They know the answer to that question. But American Jews and the rest of Americans really don't know how to respond to that yet. And to the, until they do, I think we're only likely to see more of these flashpoints and conflicts and hate crimes. And until they do, we are destined to continue to remain living in the shadow of Charlottesville. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tim. Yeah. Um, so the session is recording, um, just to remind you. And I think what we're going to do is for people, we're going to queue up questions on chat. So if you have a question, um, please queue up on 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 chat, and uh, and we'll we'll take it that way. Uh, um, uh, students get first dibs. Okay. But they may not take it. So anybody who wants to, uh... I'll just say while people are thinking about if they dare to ask a question, um, I'm I'm very happy to answer um, other questions about um, you know the experience um, at the University of Virginia, you know, um, in the aftermath, um, or the as I as I gesture to at the end of this talk, the kind of interrelated questions um, that are that are happening now about slavery and racism. In Charlottesville, and and um, and how that relates to this trial and things like that. So, um, that's an invitation to ask about that too. I think we'll we'll start off with Shaul, who has a question. Okay. Yeah, thank thank you, Jim. That was great. Um, I I want to ask you about how you think um, Eric Ward's thesis in his essay uh, "Skin in the Game" fits into this, because Ward basically tries to bring the Jew and the, the 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 Jew and the anti-blackness together within the white nationalist imagination by suggesting that for some of these white nationalists they can't quite understand how the African American inferior as they think they are could have been as successful as they've become in the society. And this is kind of like post Obama. And the Jew fits in in a certain sense because they, I mean, what Ward suggests is that the Jew is behind the African American upward mobility, that the Jew is kind of like underneath kind of pushing the the African American into this kind of new social situation. And of course, you know, you can connect that to Pittsburgh also in terms of the relationship between the synagogue and Hyas, that yeah. in, in a way it, you know, how do, how do you see, you know, what do you think of Ward's understanding that at the root of anti-blackness is the idea that the Jew is kind of, you know, in the engine room, pushing the African-American upward. Yeah. Yeah, thank you, Shaul. Um, I, I, I find that compelling. Um, I don't think it can explain the totality of that um, imagination, but I think there's something there. And I, I definitely think we see it um, in the rhetoric, um, as I as I suggested in the rhetoric of you know you saw this in this trial and in these in these um, in these leaders, um, the the black is too inferior to be able to achieve anything, so that has to be explained, right? Um, and um, I alluded to Richard Spencer, you know, that the ranting monologue that was uh, disclosed during the trial is him basically saying, "My ancestors used to rule over you," um, and the implications: what went wrong? You know, we used to be gods and now we're not. Um, so the racial hierarchy has been flipped in a disturbing way. 
And yet that can't be, so that it has to be an explanation, and the Jew is the ex explanation. I, I do think that's true. Um, I think that, um, you know, uh, what strikes me is that explains um, part of it, not all of it, because um, I think the white supremacists that, that I've now encountered, um, they fancy themselves men of the globe. Right, so they are still also trying to come up with a global theory, which isn't just about, um, um, you know, race in America. Um, and there, we we actually know this. They're more and more attuned to rightist groups and networks in Europe, um, and so they're struggling to kind of come up, as I think is often the case with, um, you know, fascist internationalisms. Right, it's 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 a it's, a, it's an attempt to figure out how to come up with a global theory, which is very hard for the far right. It's actually much easier for the for the left, right, to come up with a, a theory of, of, of global community and, and global structures. So what I'm saying is Ward's thing helps with that. It doesn't capture everything. Um, but I do think he's onto something and the kind of Jew is an engine room and the glue that ties it together as well, because that's very, uh, that's very, you know, apparent in Charlottesville is that these people are really actually diverse, you know, um, uh, in their levels of education, where they're coming from, sociologically, demographically, uh, and so that is, um, they need something to unite them, and and so that that helps. I just want to say one more quick thing about that. Um, the uh, the most interesting thing for me is the malleability in the discourse between um, every Jew must be spotted and outed. And maybe maybe it doesn't have to be strictly biological. You know, a Jew who really gets it might be able to exempt themselves from the organized Jewish committee, uh, community. You know, um, this the strange phenomenon of, of the trial was uh, one of the lawyers is a, a, a man who was born Jewish um, from Pittsburgh. You know, um, you can all look him up and um, and sort of renounced his his Jewishness. And um, the guy. <laughs> codes as Jewish. I mean, he codes uh, as, as, uh, as Jewish in terms of his affect, his style um, in the courtroom. And yet he's there uh, identifying as a non-Jewish white, right? And the implication is he's been able to kind of somehow renounce his racial status in a way that presumably a person of color cannot do. And I think there's something there to be explored, but it it's also goes back to this, to, to this idea that um, Maybe there are different kinds of Jews, you know, out there um, that we can accept. And maybe the Jew who can renounce it or the Jew who is, um, you know, um, not calling the shots or just uh, ex-Jewish. Um, but there's a lot to there's a lot there's a lot to this. And it was not lost in anybody that um, most of the plaintiffs lawyers were um, could be identified as Jews. Um, and the plaintiffs themselves did not end up including a Jewish plaintiff. So you had even more so a drama in which um, you had the Jews representing um, the racial others. So uh, Nan Fay and then Riv Ellen and then Ken. We'll just go on that tour. Sure. I don't see Nan Fay. Or is it, is it a written question? Oh, okay. Yeah, in the chat. Yeah, I see that. It's in the chat. Oh. So yeah, the question there for those of you seeing in the chat is just about what, what more can law do? Um, I have argued the law can do more than we think. Um, and at Charlottesville, one of the most striking things, and this also goes to a question about um, from Professor uh, Prell, Ravel and Prell has joined us, um, is about what was possible, what, what options were not exercised. Um, and um, one of those was that there was a state law in the books which prevented uh, the marching with lit objects um, in public spaces to intimidate people, which was an anti clan statute from the 1950s. Um, no one thought to invoke that to stop the Friday night rally. Um, that would have been a step that could be taken. Um, some, there are other people who have, have pressed that claim and, and explored that. Um, more could have been done to, um, uh, to shut down Saturday also, the gathering. Um, this is a sticky point. There's a lot to be said about it because um, many of the white supremacists claim that really um, it was all a setup because the um, what the authorities were trying to do was to kind of 
set them up to start getting into a rumble and then use that as a pretext to shut them down from speaking, to kind of foreclose prematurely uh, by declaring a public uh, disturbance, um, which is in fact what happened. Um, they shut them down and then it just got worse. Um, but the speeches planned for Saturday didn't happen. Um, you know, their point is it was a conspiracy. I don't think it was a conspiracy, but um, you know, there are laws that, that can do that kind of thing. And then of course, there's the bigger issue about speech and what can be done. And, and we're, we're in a moment now, now that Elon Musk owns Twitter, we'll all see what's gonna happen. Um, but there are issues about regulating speech, right? Um, without, um, without abridging the first amendment, which is certainly relevant to these questions. Uh, and there's plenty of law about that, um, that, that could be used. Um, I will mention that this continued after the trial because for instance, um, one of the other defendants before the trial began um, set up shop uh, live tweeting um, from the University of Virginia Law Library from which he, he graduated from law school and kind of baiting people, you know? Um, and so, um, and that he was stopped because there were ways to stop that. You know, the regulations and laws that can be used to stop that even though it's a public institution here. So there is a lot to be done. Um, I would say that uh, we're at a moment of retrieving lost ideas and re-examining law codes and thinking through um, not just First Amendment jurisprudence, but civil rights legislation. Um, some of that creativity is coming from inside the Jewish community. Um, some of it is more connected to Israel-Palestine. Um, and so that makes it much harder, I think, to see um, where it could go because it often gets uh, extremely uh, polarized and politicized uh, right away um, because of that issue, um, but which was not central to this trial. It's, it's worth reminding us. Uh, Ravellan, do you want to pick up? Did that answer your question well enough, or do you want to follow up on that? And then Ken, and then Harvey. Uh, you're muted. After all these years, but still. Anyway, thank you, Jim, for a terrific talk. <laughs> but I, I. My, my larger question, and thank you for allowing us to ask something tangential to the trial, is the uh, refusal of the UVA police to in any way intervene to protect students on Friday still haunts me. Yeah. And um, I wondered, uh, did the university investigate that? Did they look into it? Was their defense something about protecting the rights? Were they, I mean, it, it was so outrageous and I've never seen anyone else particularly addressing it, writing about it. And I wonder how the institution addressed it or if it just went away. Yes. Um, yeah, it is, it is very disturbing. Uh, and the answer is it hasn't been significantly addressed. Um, the, um, the main focus has been by um, student activists of that moment of course people graduate move on but some faculty as well saying um there was um w this would this was an intelligence failure and in fact what the university said was just we didn't we got overwhelmed we didn't realize what was really going to happen here and, and that it was going in that direction and the, and the response from people who were affected by it was we actually tried to contact you to tell you you know that there's that there's word of what's going on uh, just because you're not social media fanatics like we are doesn't mean you should dismiss what we're saying if we say this is an organizing mob that's beginning to gather right and talking about gathering. Um, so that's just a sore point it was wasn't resolved, I will say that um, for this university. Um, it uh, nothing ever um, remains just as it is it gets reframed based on what happens afterwards so. You know, um, this goes back to the question about different kinds of white supremacy, but one of the responses immediately afterwards from student activists was to say we want to take down the statue of Thomas Jefferson. Because that's an icon of white supremacy after all the white supremacists were worshiping it, you know, um, and so therefore we need to we need to we need the university to own its own past. Um, I think that was a, a mistake, you know, I mean, I think there are ways that the university did and does need to reckon and is doing it. Um, but that was a kind of impassioned response from some. And once that happened, the university went on the defensive about, um, you know, radical speech of, of different kinds, right? And the both sides effect kicked in. Um, that, um, that was a, 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 a real dilemma. Um, and, um, you know, the university did a bunch of other things, um, but I think it basically understood this ultimately as 
about um, trying to uh, reassert its commitment to democracy, reassert its commitment to re reckoning with slavery and racism at the university were the best responses. Um, but that is, um, you know, that that is one response. Um, in the eyes of of some, it wasn't enough. Uh, Ken Harvey Gale. Yes, thanks, Jim. That was great. Um, since you're so incisive, I'd like to hear um, what insights you can give also on the question of how this is a precedent or re related to, relevant to what happened and what is happening in the trials um, around January 6th. Yeah, thanks, Ken. Um, yeah, I mean, so that 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 federal law um, has been um, invoked uh, in some of the trials uh, intended to, um, you know, seek justice um, for people involved in um, January 6th rioting. Um, and uh, I think the answer is the jury's still out, no pun intended. Uh, you know, I think that um, had this had that federal claim been sustained, I think it would have gotten a, a lot more purchase on the imagination of the media um, and I think that would have um, helped to animate some of the conversations about what could happen and, and also then affected some of the legal tactics, um, but it didn't. So uh, I don't know what'll, where that will go, to be very honest. Um, I think the potential is there, but I do think that one of the things that immediately begins to happen is a kind of conceptual confusion about race and about how much race is central to this and about who the victims are and um, you know in what ways is this targeting racial minorities and not and again that we go back to what i've stressed which is the, the why the jews um, are not just an ambiguous in this but um, in some ways typify the ambiguity about um, racially motivated violence um, it would seem to be so obvious and yet it's not um, always so I think the January 6th stuff is, is a lot of that, um, it is wrapped up in that. I think, we'll, I think we will see more, um, but um, I'll mention just one more thing that, that really um, is relevant to this. Um, the lawyers, um, some of the lawyers are prominent lawyers and are, and are, are strongly identified with the Democratic Party. Um, uh, people I respect, uh, but people who've been involved and in, involved in democratic administrations even. So um, I do think that affected how the national media viewed this trial, uh, why the conservative media um, blacked it out effectively. They said it's the other side doing this, we don't want to do them any favors. And I do think that's another factor in kind of um, how all of this stuff will play out. If it, We all know everything's politicized right, um, right now, but there's something particular about it if it's seen as a democratic um, party move Right, um, and uh, the courts are supposed to be where we go to to leave politics behind, but that's as as we know, um, increasingly difficult to to, to achieve. Thanks. I'm not sure if that was incisive, but that's what I can say. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Harvey and Gail, and then Jared. Yeah, I wonder if you could say a little bit more about relations between uh, Black Lives Matter and the Jewish community as a whole. Uh, since Charlottesville and other anti-Semitic uh, events that have taken place, uh, yeah. you know, in both directions, whether Black Lives Matter uh, has has reached out to the Jewish community, has emphasized anti-Semitism more than it had, and also whether the Jewish community has responded by uh, attempting to forge a closer relationship with Black Lives Matter. Yeah. Uh, and maybe even more broadly, just talk about the generally, I know that's a big, big uh, thing to talk about, just the American left and yeah. whether its disposition toward Jews and anti-Semitism has changed in your view since Charlottesville. Sure, thank you. Um, well, to start with the last part of your question, um, I'm not sure that it's changed. I think there's a struggle on the American left to make sense of anti-Semitism because of its relationship to the theme I've, excuse me, stressed here, which is, um, you know, um, white whiteness, right? Um, and the perception that Jews are um, not quite the same 
type of minority and Jews are not, but Jews can still be victims of racially motivated violence, right? And of course, they're Jews of color, but that only seems to confuse, I think, many people when they think about this, because then they say, well, if Jews are, if they're, if they're, if they're black Jews, right, or Latino Jews, then that means that Jewishness isn't really a racial minority at all. So long story short, I think um, there's been less clarity than I would have expected or hoped for um, from the American left about how to frame anti-Semitism as a problem to be uh, challenged and confronted. Um, and, and relations between Jewish and black communities, um, I think they're very complicated. Um, I, don't, I don't think there's been, um, you know, there's a strong sense among many parts of Jewish America that Black Lives Matter as a movement um, got um, overtaken by anti-Zionist and anti-Semitic elements. Um, and I think there's a, um, a sense among some Black Lives Matter activists that uh, anti-Semitism is again sort of a sideshow or a distraction from deeper issues at the heart of American society. Um, you know, that to me um, is, uh, it's a complicated story because I don't think that Black Lives Matter is a single movement, I'm a single leadership structure, right? Um, and so it's not actually very well organized. It's not, um, it's, it's divided internally. Some of its leaders were are pushed out. So it's not very easy to point to it and say who the they is and who the they are supposed to be talking to in the Jewish world. Um, but I will say this, um, in, a, in a larger sense, steering away from black Jewish relations towards the question of, of the left and the progressive left, um, it's, uh, it's clear to me that there are tensions um, uh, between liberals and uh, leftists or liberals and progressives, right? Center left and further left. Um, again, about how much to center anti-Semitism as a, as a challenge. Um, and uh, that is that plays out in different ways. I frankly think it played out to some degree um, in Charlottesville sort of uh, agendas. Um, and uh, much of that does have to do with the Israeli-Palestinian conflict seeping into people's frames of reference. Uh, I'll give you one example of how that's played out here. Um, in the aftermath of, of 2017, uh, there was a, um, you know, a solidarity movement emerging among students. You know, let's come together, it's a vigil, let's, let's sort of support each other. Um, and the Jewish student group was excluded from that um, because of their purported ties to Israel. Um, there was a series of discussions that actually went on for years um, in which the question was, can the Jewish student group, um, AKA the Hillel, can they be part of the Minority Students Coalition? Um, and it involved Muslim student groups, Palestinian student groups who said, we don't want them in there unless they're not connected to Israel in any way, shape or form. And Jewish students saying, what does Israel have to do with this? And many student leaders who um, felt caught in the middle, weren't really sure even how to navigate that saying, well, maybe Jewish students can be honorary members of the Minority Students Coalition, but not officially members, which um, I'm smiling because that typifies, I think, again, that kind of ambiguous role of Jews, right? Um, yes, you've suffered, but we can't quite place you in our, in our spectrum, in our roster here of the people because of this other issue or because, you know, it just doesn't compute. Um, I know many people, many student leaders who, who, who worked on that issue, not just um, Jewish students, others who um, not representing minority students, Jewish students, any, uh, any of those um, who were engaged with that, trying to broker dialogue on, on grounds here um, unsuccessfully. Um, and so I think that's a real challenge. Uh, it's a real challenge for everybody involved. Yeah, and then Jared. Jared, I'm sort of anticipating your question, so please step in and ask again what my question doesn't cover. Thank you so much for your lecture. I'm interested in the way that social media allows the production of a collective identity or a collective subjectivity, almost regardless of what actually is happening on the ground. So you said that BLM mm -hmm. on the ground is fragmented and complex, it's true, but symbolically or ideologically, it's, it's a unity. And I wanna to return to the sense that 
uh, the, the Jewish community writ large in this ideological sense was not able to come up with a symbol, was not able to generate through social media any kind of affiliative subjectivity. Um, and just wanting to understand that a bit more as somebody who's not a, a Jew, yeah. um, under, trying to understand what this means for Jewish subjectivity or collective identity in the United States. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, it's a wonderful question. And I, I have a, a suspicion that perhaps you have more thoughts on it, um, even than I do. Um, uh, but here's what I'd say. Um, uh, yeah, I, I've, I've, I've pondered that a lot. Um, and I've also listened and been part of conversations with people try and um, brainstorm. Well, what is the meme? You know, what, what could it be? Um, and I do think that um, I, I'm not an expert in the theory of you know social media and and how these things um, arise. Um, so um, I won't speak to sort of what are the conditions that would need to obtain for that to be. But I, what I will say is um, that uh, a couple of things immediately um, emerge. One is I think the Holocaust. Um, both um, uh, mobilizes and gets in the way of that because it, you know, it, it's, you, you know, what is it? Is it God, Godwin's law that every, you know, internet discussion um, eventually devolves us to a Nazi analogy of the Holocaust and then it just shuts down. So, um, you know, um, in a certain sense, the Jewish meme is already there, um, uh, whether it's never again which is one or never again now. And those are memes that have been mobilized, but also used for some other causes for, for Jewish progressives in recent years. Um, but it's very tricky because it, it both, um, it, it, it works and yet it also distracts. Um, so I think that's one issue. I think another issue is um, that um, there is something I would say of um, a challenge of identity going on in Jewish America. Um, and some of it has to do with um, a reckoning about Israeli society and the fate of Israeli democracy and what's going on with it, and, you know, rising anti-Semitism and also a perception that Israel has changed dramatically in its political culture and orientation. Um, and for the for the smaller but real percentage of Jewish Americans who identify with the right, um, things may actually make more sense, and there is no contradiction. But for a lot of people in the center liberal spheres and to the left of that, there's a, um, there's a challenge and a confusion about that. Um, how to reconcile what seems like um, an identification with a Jewish, um, you know, national project with a, a Jewish country, um, with uh, liberal democratic values, which don't seem to jibe with that. So I think that makes it harder to come up with memes, right, and, and, and slogans. Um, and, uh, you know, I will say, for instance, one of the things that's begun to spread on social media um, is a campaign to adopt the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance um, definition of anti-Semitism. So I think it's, you know, adopt the IRA. So that's not Black Lives Matter, but that's kind of a, a tag that particular younger Jewish activists or some are, are beginning to use, you know, um, embrace the definition. Um, and um, that's a policy demand. It's also one associated with the controversy about that definition and whether it's the right one and effective and, and, and good for law, bad for law. Um, to, uh, you know, and there's a lot to say about that because there have been other um, uh, debates and alternatives to it. Um, but that's a so long much bad one. faith on Jewish Twitter. What's that? There's so much bad. There's so much bad faith on Jewish Twitter. It's amazing. Right. Right. Um, so, but it hasn't happened, and I think it's you know the let's just say that um, the the internal complexity, of the Jewish American sphere. And um, and these tensions and and these tensions over like a shifting alignments in it, I think have, have made it much harder to do that. Um, and I'll say one other thing though: um, there are many uh, Jews in America who don't want to have a Jewish tag uh, for their Twitter. They would prefer to say "hate has no home here." They would prefer to say, you know, um, this is about protecting us as Americans. And this is a longer story about much, much has been written, more could be said, but um, I would I would put it somewhat bluntly as they don't want to minoritize themselves. They don't want to be tagged that way. It's important for them not to be seen um, as um, too different, too other, 
right? And um, that's a choice and a luxury, I guess, in a certain sense, for some um, from Jews compared to African Americans. Um, but thank you for the question. It's, it's a really, it's a really stimulating, interesting one. Uh, Jared and Marcia. Um, Gail kind of just, I mean, kind of answered my question with uh, that last answer. So not really sure yeah. what I want to say, but um, uh, yeah, no, thank you for a really interesting talk. I guess, you know, were the slogans um, from Pittsburgh, the, uh, the never again or never again at home, or were there something else that they were doing you know, slogan wise? Yeah, it was that. And um, I, I, there was one other that, um, even though I'm on Zoom, I'm not going to go over to my laptop and look it up. But there's one other one that, that did emerge briefly. Um, yeah, but the never again, I mean, you know, never again does a lot of work. Um, it's it's open. It, it's, it suggests, you know, it, it reaches back to the Holocaust, but it can be used to, to refer to many, many other things. Um, uh, this evening is the beginning of uh, Yom HaShoah, the, the day in the Jewish liturgical calendar uh, commemorating the Holocaust. Uh, communities around the world are taking part in that. And some of the messaging around that is never again means stop a nuclear Iran, or never again means speak up for Jewish pride, or never again means stop you know, um, the Democratic Party, right? So it, it, it's, it's open and, and can be used in different ways politically. Um, and I think, so it, it, it's effective actually in that sense. Um, although personally, as a scholar of this, it really bothers me because I think that's actually um, a problem to have to um, a slogan that can, that, that's so unbounded and yet can be so easily deployed. Um, maybe that's the problem for some people with Black Lives Matter too, is that it, it, it actually, um, once it's on corporate logos, maybe it doesn't do the same work of um, a moral urgency or the same work of a, a demand for a certain type of justice. Stronger than hate. So Jeremy Shenders put, just put that in, stronger than hate. So there you go, stronger than hate was, was the Pittsburgh slogan, right? And um, that's a good slogan. Uh, it doesn't tell you anything about Jewish lives, right? Or Jewish bodies. Um, but um, I think it went with an image of like a Steelers image or a Pittsburgh image too. So um, they're, they're, that's um, I'm not going to talk about football. Marcia. Uh, so let me thank you, uh, Professor Loeffler, for your talk. I really appreciated it and um, was very much interested in the um, supersessionist uh, images that you brought up. Uh, but my question here, and I'll say a little bit about what spurred it, is uh, would you speak a little bit more about the ambiguity uh, that you mentioned of Jews not wanting to decide uh, how they might want to be identified? Why mm -hmm. the indecision? And, uh, and part of why the figure of the Jew, as you put it, uh, this, and particularly in regard to the supersessionist theme, the Christianist supersessionist theme, um, the reason it spurred that is because I thought of the way in which white nationalists um, co-opt the yeah. the language, the biblical language of Puritans, yes. <laughs> and that language which being sure part of the your... American myth, if you will. Yeah. Um, and so, oh, okay, I'll I'll stop there, but. If you can hear hear what I'm saying now, I think I, I heard it all. No, thank thank you. Yeah, no, that's a fascinating observation and, mm -hmm. and, and a wonderful question. So I yeah I agree with you. Um, so where does that ambiguity um, and ambivalence come from? Um, I, I guess I'd put it this way. Yeah, I mean, um, although I've been personally critical of the concept of Judeo Christian for some of the reasons that uh, um, I, I think I'm suggesting about supersessionism and these these you know theological categories um uh i think for many american jews uh it's an inclusive concept right it's a concept of uh, of you know um writing jews into the mythos of america right and saying that um religious inclusion um and that this this uh organic relationship between jews and christians is um is a positive one and is the right way to describe jewish difference Right, that we want to think about religious pluralism, um, and that is um, more palatable than other kinds of ethnic difference for Jews who may not even, you know, might be not might not be right to call, um, to, you know, to, to to use racial terminology. But you know, um, 
this was certainly true um, beginning after World War II, really started before of Jews saying, okay, the, the true pluralism of America should be, yes, blacks and whites and other people of color, and then um, a tri-faith America of different religions, Protestant, Catholic, Jew, um, um, or just Jews and Christians. And, and so, but I'm, what I'm suggesting therefore is that, um, you know, I do think Jews want a model of, of difference. They want, a, they want a way to articulate a distinct identity, but it's perhaps less threatening to do that in terms of um, a religious identity than to say, well, wait a second, there are ways in which we have a collective um, identity, which is, uh, you know, um, which has ethnic components, right, which has descent built into it. Um, so I'm not sure if that answers the question as well as I, I would have hoped, because I think you're, you're, you're pointing out something very profound about it. But um, but I think I, I do agree with you um, that there's this ambiguity. It has to be better explained why Jews want to hesitate. Actually, I think, I think you put your finger on it rightly in saying that there's a recognition of being written into this myth at the yeah. same time you're written out of it, <laughs> you know, yeah, because, yeah, the, yeah. because yeah. the Puritans are yeah. supersessionists, yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. par excellence. But yeah. at the same time, you've got these African-Americans early in the history of this country who are identifying with the liberatory strains yes. of Jewish <laughs> biblical history, yeah. you know. And so and that's where the that's where the multiracial stuff comes in. And yeah. so, I mean, I can see why there might be, uh, you know, this this kind of ball that's yeah. that's that's going on here. But I also wonder, too, about the way in which um, that complexity factors into an assimilationist one as right. well that says that, OK, all people who can pass as white, basically, yeah. who can be yeah. part of whiteness now, should be somehow identifying with the whiteness thing, yeah. <laughs> you know? yeah. uh, which would seem to me to be pulling Jewish people apart basically yeah no I, I i think that's i think that's true um and you know to put a finer po point on it i think that's one of the challenges um for for jewish americans to figure out how, what language to speak and how to um avoid the accusation of not just ambivalence but trying to have it both ways right well trying trying to um carve out um, a, a privilege of difference at certain times, but then carve out a different privilege of majority belonging, you know, um, and, and, and that's, um, um, that's also the case, by the way, not just with, um, uh, but race, but with religion too, right? I mean, the Judeo-Christian is a problem, not just for what it does with the supersessionism, but, but um, um, uh, all the communities, all the religious, um, you know, communities and religions that, that it, that it, that it defines itself against. Um, and I'm, I'm surprised at its resilience, even I'm not surprised at its resilience in some parts of the political right where it seems to align with a, a general orientation. I'm surprised at its resilience still in some parts of what I would call the political left um, in Jewish America, that it still is attractive, um, even though it would seem to be fundamentally exclusionary towards you know um, uh, so many um, fellow Americans. But um, but it gets to that, to, to, to I think what we're, what we're talking about. I, I think picking up on Marsha's point and Jared and, and Gail as well, there used to be a kind of melodiousness that is there were, or we thought that there was a kind of melodiousness to American Jewishness. And I think we're living in a media environments that are so full of static. Um, and the Jewish static comes down to questions about whiteness and politics and class and Israel. Um, there's, 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 the, and and it's it's aggravated by isolation and COVID. Uh, I, I, there's just so much static. It's hard to be optimistic of 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 working of working of working through that noise right now. Uh, mm. I, I just I just don't see it. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, let me put, let me try a different spin on it. Let me, let me be more optimistic for a second. Um, you know, the landscape is changing. And one thing that sociologists of American Jewry tell us is that um, um, the profile of who Jews are in America is changing, right? Um, um, and the numbers are um, slightly imprecise, but they, by some accounts, I believe um, around 
10% of um, living Jewish Americans maybe also be people of color, right? So I, I, that, that makes it, that, that's bound to make more noise and static, but I actually think that can make things also productive um, mm -hmm. in the way of breaking out of some of these um, impasses by forcing a different way of, of, of reckoning with identity for Jews, right? Um, uh, that, that in the same way that multiracial America, as you know, scholars of that note, um, changes uh, the potentially the way Americans can think about these categorizations um, and about race and religion. So I, I think things are changing. Um, how fast, I don't know. Um, and whether that just makes more static and noise before it brings back the melody to which you alluded, um, you know, is, is an open question. Um, but I'll give you one example. I mean, one of the bright spots, since I, since I regaled you all with, with um, descriptions of the trial, um, there were no Jewish plaintiffs, but the uh, lawyers made a point of bringing um, a young woman to testify as a witness who had been um, uh, steps away from the Friday night rally in her, in her dorm room, um, and a, a woman who identify, who is Latina and Jewish, you know, and she's dignifies as a person of color, she's a person of color, um, uh, as well as queer. And, um, you know, it was a powerful, um, it's a powerful sight, right? Somebody who comes up there and says, I actually am vulnerable in a lot of different ways to this hate. Um, and talks about both, she invoked all the tropes. She talked about both her own um, family members escape from the Holocaust, going back generations, and her experience, um, uh, you know, going through it. And it was kind of a, a rich overlay of things together. Um, it was kind of the white supremacist nightmare, right? When the, when, when the Jew has become um, actually, uh, you know, simultaneously a person of color and a Jew, um, it's, it's, it's a, it's kind of a, a conjunction of all these things, but that was a compelling sight, right. Um, about someone who could say, um, yeah, I don't fit your stereotypes of what I should look like. Um, um, and, uh, yet I'm very much a part of the story and I'm very much part of this, you know, this legal case. So, um, I, I think there's something, something positive in the complexity of the complexion not to be punny, but um, of, of, of Jewish America as it's as it's shaping up. Thank you. That might be a nice place to start. There is nobody left on queue and chat. Uh, and it is now closing in on 8, 8.30, let's say. Um, does anybody want to say anything more? Um, let me just open that up real quick. And I'm going to think no, and and thank you to to uh, to my colleagues and to uh, to to students and to uh, and to and to Jim for uh, for really a, a, a wonderful event and a wonderful talk. Uh, we're going to record. This is recording. Uh, we have not yet decided what we're going to do with the recording, uh, but anybody who once a recording, uh, you have my email. I'm at uh, the Department of Religion website. Um, if I don't know you and you want a recording of this, and if Jim agrees to, 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 to do that, um, uh, then the, the thing, it will be available. And uh, uh, just again, thank you so very, very much. And, and uh, good night. Thanks, thank Jim. Thank you all. Great to see you. And thank you for coming. Jim, stick around if you could.